Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Federico Perdicisi, and I am from Argentina. To give you some background information, I work for Soluciones Workout and co-work at Tecnología Workout, which is an internet service provider. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> right now, I'm working on a bachelor's degree in organizations information system. I have the following MicroTIC certification, and I have been working and networking with MicroTIC for the last four years. I come all the way to Dubai to do the train the trainer course, so hopefully by the end of this week of this week, I'm going to become a certified a certified trainer. So today I would like to talk you about our core business in Soluciones Workout, from now on just Workout or WKO, which is to provide to our customers who are custom brokers with access to the custom server farm. Okay? This business needs 24 hours uptime as it's critical if it, any delays occurs when the custom broker is rele releasing the merchandise. This kind of delay carries a significant, coach, a significant cost, so we upgraded our infrastructure in order to ensure the constant access to the server's farm. The, the last upgrade we did was to uh, add redundancy using BRRP, OSPF, and BFD. So in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to give you the basics about BRRP, OSPF, and BFD. We are going to see the steps for configuring this failover environment. We are going to taste it. And then I'm, I will give you some final comments. And after that, there will, there will be some time for questions and answers. OK, so this was our original network topology. As you can see, customers access to our networks using virtual private networks. And then we will route their traffic uh, over a transport layer service or a wireless link to the custom server farm. But as you can see, this gave us a big point of failure as we only have a pair of routers, one on each side. So if any of these routers fail, we are going to be, or we will be unable to route the traffic to the server's farm. So someone could just think, okay, an easy solution is to add a second router. Well, however, this wasn't that simple because the customs only allow us to access to their network with only one IP address. And we also need to provide them um, only one, a unique next hub to reach our network. So in order to add this redundancy, I asked for permission to add a second router using virtual router redundancy protocol, and then OSPF and BFD. The um, custom building is only accessible during working hours. So imagine that the routers fails at night. We have to wait until morning and then start fulfilling all the permission requirements, requirements and so on, and then replace the failing router. So this addition has increased the much needed time we need to coordinate and arrange the um, replacement of the failing router. Okay, so what is exactly BRRP? BRRP means Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, and it's defined in the Request for Comments 3768. It allows you to create a master failover, a master backup, sorry, failover configuration um, with two or more routers. It's a um, virtual interface that runs over a physical one, okay? And when you are setting up, setting the, this BRRP interface, you have to set a um, virtual router identifier that has to be the same for all the routers that are participating in this failover environment. You have to set priorities. Um, the highest priority is 255, so the router that has to be, or you need, or you want to be the master, is going to have 255, and then lower for any backup router. The default time of convergence is three seconds. This can be improved, as I am going to show you later. The MicroTik Wiki recommends you to use uh, an IP address slash 32 when this virtual interface has an IP address from the same subnet range that the, that the um, physical interfaces. So in this case, this is what I did. <coughs> well, how does BRRP works? BRRP sends, when you turn on all the routers, they start sending multicast packets with their virtual router identif identifier and the um, priority they have. Once the um, router with the highest priority is selected, it becomes master, and the other becomes, of course, backups. 
So when this happens, the only router that will continue sending these multicast packets is the master one, while the um, backup routers are waiting or listening to these multicast packets. When the backup routers don't receive these multicast packets for three times the interval or the announcement time, which is by default one second, there is where you have the three seconds of convergence, um, the selection process begins again. Okay, so all virtual router, uh, virtual router redundancy protocol interfaces have the same IP address. So how can uh, other hosts or other routers find the MAC address to reach the, um, this VRRP or the master router? Well, it's simple. The MAC address is the same for all VRRP interfaces. The format is 00005E00011X, where this XX is the virtual router identifier in hex, okay? Perfect. Regarding the switch where all these routers converge, I must tell you that there are non-static ARP entries configured. So this is why this configuration is possible without further considerations. Perfect. Um, about OSPF and BFD. I'm going to keep it short about OSPF since most of you already know how it works, but for those who don't, it's an internal gateway protocol. This means that runs into or inside an autonomous system. And this protocol will automatically detect, using an algorithm, the best path or the shortest path to reach a destination. About bidirectional forwarding detection, it's, um, it's used as a helper for some AGPs, for example, OSPF, and it establishes a session between two endpoints, okay, that where these routers will become neighbors. And it will send, each router will send to the other, hello packets each 200 milliseconds by default. This can be, of course, changed. Then um, once, for example, if it, ha if it happens that one router don't receive several of these hello packets, it will consider that the other neighbor is down, okay? There is something we have to take into account when using BFD on wireless. If we have long range wireless links or some maybe com complicated environment, it could happen that because of the signal noise or the latency, the, this protocol considers the other network is flapping or shuts down. So this is something you have to, to take into account if you want to use BFD uh, in long distance uh, environments. So once again, this was our original network topology, and this is the one we achieved after applying these changes. So once again, we have some things to consider. Custom network has to be, need to have only one IP address to reach our network. There are non-static ARP entries in the switches where all these routers converge. Wireless distance is less than 400 meters, and something very important is that there is no connection tracking used in redundant routers. We are going to see why. This is a screenshot from the Dude Monitor, one network map, that we are going to use from now on to check how all this works. So we are going to split this scenario in two. On the left, we have the work outside, and on the right, the custom side. The network address translation, or the masquerade action, take place on the tunnel's gateway, okay? This means that the sessions are being handled by this router. So this also means that these four redundant routers don't use connection tracking. And why is that this so important? Because imagine that this one of these routers, these redundant routers, it's handling the connection of our customers with the custom servers. If that router fails, this connection will need to be reestablished. So that won't be transparent for our, our customers, okay? In this case, it is transparent. So now we have two pair of routers on each side, which are part of this failover environment. Each of these pair of uh, routers have a unique virtual router identifier in the BRRP configuration. Okay, about routing, Tunnels Gateway knows that to reach the customs IP address, need to go to the BRRP master IP address. And on the other hand, on the custom firewall, the same occurs with the master router. Okay, so some Mike, uh, the last presenter, uh, in one slide shows something about this. It's a very low, well known best practice to use loopback interfaces when setting up OSPF. We are going to see, to see how, why in a few slides. But 
just to let you know, uh, loopback interfaces is, is never going to be down, okay? Immediately you, to create a loopback interface, you need to create a bridge and with no ports in it and just name it and assign an IP address to it. A loopback interfaces are going to be very useful, for example, for management. We are going to see why in this, this next slide. I, this is the IP address I put on each router of, of, the, of the four redundant routers. And this that I'm showing you is not a, a physical mesh, okay? I'm just showing you that all the routers have a static routes that will let them reach to the loopback IP address of the other routers in any way that is possible, okay? So, as I told you before, loopback interfaces are never going to be down. So, if there is any way to reach them, that, that loopback interfaces, you are going to be able to manage the router. So about, uh, we are going to start out now configuring BRRP. It's very simple, you just need to go to the interface menu, add BRRP, and then you set a name on it. After this, you have, well, you have here both uh, configuration for master and backup, but we select the interface where we want o uh, BRRP to run onto, we select the build router identifier, that once again is the same for both uh, redundant routers. In this case, priority for the master, 255, and lower for the backup. And this is where I speed up the process of uh, convergence. I switch or change the default one second value to 0 0.20. So this, as I told you before, um, the, the backup routers wait until three times the announced spend time, so this gave us 0 0.60 seconds of convergence time, pretty much better than the default three seconds, okay? Well, now about OSPF. We are going to assign the loopback IP address to the default OSPF instance on each router. This is because I choose to use the default instance. If you're using any other instance, it's recommended to use the same, to, to do the same. Why is this important? Well, because if you assign to the router ID the IP address from the loopback interface that is never going to be down, it means that that router ID is never going to change. So this avoids waste of time when the, route, the um, OSPF needs to recalculate the best path when that router ID changes. In this case, we are going to redistribute connected and static routes, okay? Well, to start running the protocol, we need to add the network that belongs to the physical interface, or, or virtual, it could be, uh, where we want OSPF to run. So once we uh, add it, we will see that on the interface tab, we will have an automatically or dynamic interfaces uh, running OSPF. In this case, we need to make it customizable. We are going to copy it to do so, and then we are going to change the network time from broadcast to point to point, then we state that we need to use OSPF. And in this case, I change also the hello and router that interval from the false value 10 and 14, 10 and 40, sorry, uh, to five and 10. This is to fasten up the process of discovery any topological change. Well, about OSPF, uh, sorry, BFD, the, I use the default setup. By default, it's available in all the interfaces and send hello packets each 200 milliseconds. Once you, s you state that you use BFD, for example, in the OSP, OSPF interface, you will see in the network tab, the, that interface uh, uh, appears there. And then you s if you have done the same on the other, the other end, you will see that the state is up. This means that the um, BFD session has been established. Okay, so once again, this is the... Um, the network map we, we use, but before uh, seeing how or testing this environment, I want to tend to tell you a funny story about the moment when we were about to implement these things. Um, we notify our customers like two weeks before implementing this, and we have only half an hour at midday to, to do it. So when I, when it was the time, the help desk coordinator called me and asked me to please notify him when I was just about to make the changes, so he could, so he could be aware if someone calls or complains because the, the service wasn't working, uh, that it was because I was working on the, on the configuration of the network. So my answer was, all the changes are already done, uh, I finished five minutes ago. So as you can see, this was totally transparent for our customers and really satisfying for me. So 
let's see how this works. As you can see, the transfer layer service or the fiber optic link is the principal. The wireless, links, the wireless link is going to be the secondary. As well, the two routers that handle the, master, the transfer layer service are the ones that are going to be mastered. So we have OSPF routes with distance, administrative distance of 110, and the packet flow is going to be the following. Perfect. But now it could happen that uh, any router or the TLS service, for example, fail. In any case, the backup router or links are going to become active. So what happens if the WKO TLS router fails? It will send the packet by the, the tunnels gateway, will send the packet to the WKO wireless LAN, which is now the master router. And this will route the traffic over the wireless link to the custom firewall. And when the answer comes to the custom firewall, it will still see as, the, as master router the custom TLS, okay? because it's still active. So what happened then? No route to host. This router don't knows how to reach the tunnels gateway again. So I added these two inter-VR RP backup links, which are physical links, okay? With static routes with an administrative distance of 200. So now, when the tunnels gateway send the package, it goes to the server farm, and now the answer has a route to reach the tunnels gateway, so it will continue as normal. The only thing that could happen here is that some customer could make a trace route and see that we have one more hub. But this is very unlikely, and it, so it's totally transparent for our customers. Okay, what happened now if the transport layer service itself fails? The tunnels gateway will send the message or the packet to the master router, which is still the WKO TLS. But this don't have this OSPF route, but it has the backup routes, let's say. So the packet will continue to flow, and it will reach, once again, our customers. So let me show you why I told you that uh, using loopback interfaces is pretty important. Okay, now we have this do, uh, these two network maps that are as, uh, they do this locally hosted on my computer, and it's also connected to a pair of routers they have back, back down here. Uh, on this, the left map, we have the routers map, which is monitoring the routers by their uh, service IP address. While on the right, we have the loopback map where all those uh, routers, the, the four London routers, are being monitored by the loopback IP address. So now we are going to run a pin command to the custom firewall just to show you how this is working. Okay, so now I'm going to simulate that the transfer layer service is failing, okay? So I am going to do it right now you will see that the routers become red and once again green. On the um, roads map, or the or map of the left, you see that the custom TLS uh, router is still down. This is because we cannot reach the service IP address of that router. Well, on the loopback map, we, are, we have all in green. I will show you. Here, if I try to connect to the custom TLS by its service IP, nothing happens. While well, if I want to enter by the loopback IP address, I'm in, okay? So, as you can see, this is pretty useful. I'm going to bring up again the, um, the transparent layer service, so everything is green again. Once again, I'm going to shoot down the custom uh, TL, no, sorry, 
the WKO TLS router, I'm going to shut it down. And this is uh, to simulate that the, um, wait a minute. We are going to simulate that that router is failing, okay? So this is going to be help us to prove my point. So system shut down, yes. And now you can see that we have, well, oh yeah. Now you can see that the, um, on the loopback map, everything is down, also on the rotors map. But if you give me a second, you will see that on the loopback map, the custom TLS is going to become active again. And this is why I use OSPF combined with, B with BFD to the, there you have, okay? And it's the, the following slide that I'm going to show you why I use OSPF. Well, first of all, this option check gateway with ping, it's very, pretty much slower than using OSPF with BFD. You have seen it just, re just re in, the, in the last second, okay? And the second reason that I w what I use OSPF is to uh, avoid manually adding uh, static roads. Sometimes we need to grant access to our customers to for example, a new host, a new subnet, or just a DMC. In that case, we, um, we just can connect to the both routers on the custom side, add the static road, and let the, those roads propagate themselves. So it's simpler. Then let me give you a final recommendation, that is to use the third tab of the BRRP interface, or the scripts tab. In this case, this is a screenshot from the um, WKO wireless LAN router, which is the backup, remember? And on this script, it's sending me, sending me an email when on, on master, okay, in this case, when it's master, send me an email saying that the secondary BRRP router on the WKO side is now active. On the other hand, when the other router recovers and this uh, router becomes backup again, it sent me an email saying that the um, the master router on WKO side is now active. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. If anyone has any question, I will be happy to answer them. No questions? Okay, if you think of, an, of any question later, here is my email, my email address where you can write me and I will reply you. Thank you so much for your attention.